hear me okay? Great. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to tonight's event. Welcome to everyone joining us on the live stream and here in person at 325 Church. Uh, so my name is Terry Peters. I'm the host for the evening and the co-chair along with Professor Will Galloway of the uh, Department of Architectural Science uh, Lecture Committee. Um, we've divided the, the roles this evening into two parts. So I'll begin with a few comments and then Will will let us know about the schedule for the evening. And Jana, one of our uh, student committee members will introduce tonight's speaker, Johanna Herm. Uh, so this lecture is the second in our lecture series this term, sorry, it's the third in our lecture series this term, uh, sponsored by the Ontario Association of Architects and the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. So thank you to both. Um, to put this evening's discussion into context, this lecture series is designed to be a learning opportunity for our students and to connect with the larger architectural community. It allows us to extend what we're learning in the classroom and build some of the context and flavor of the ideas of the topic that we're focusing on every day. So this term, our lecture committee invited um, speakers who are practicing in unique and interesting ways um, and producing really innovative work. So we're very lucky, lucky to hear from all of them and especially tonight's guest. So before I pass the microphone over to Will, I'd like to read our land acknowledgement. Um, so Toronto Metropolitan University sits on lands that are now known as Toronto that have been inhabited by for millennia by many indigenous nations and peoples. It is our tradition to begin meetings with a land acknowledgement, which not only recognizes the enduring presence and resilience of indigenous, indigenous peoples in our area, but also as a reminder that we are all accountable to these relationships. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share this territory and protect this land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. It is in this spirit on behalf of our university and our department that I welcome you to Toronto Metropolitan University and on behalf of the, fel of the faculty, I welcome you tonight. Over to Will. Yeah. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Will Galloway. Uh, I'm just going to cover a few practical things and before we get the student to introduce Johanna, um, first of all, the lecture is about 45 or 50 minutes, uh, and then after that, we'll have questions. So if you've got any questions, uh, just keep them in, until that time. Uh, and can I also ask you to stay until the end of the, the question period? So don't, uh, don't leave because there's still lots to, to hear. Um, and I think those are the main things actually. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's about it. So why don't I ask uh, who's, who's giving the introduction? Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Johanna Herm is an architect at Winnipeg based 5468796 Architecture. For the past 15 years, the firm has been pursuing a critical architectural response to contemporary issues in multifamily housing and urban design, grounded in real life practice based experience and a tandem investigation into worldwide housing research and built work. Her work has been awarded numerous recognitions nationally and internationally, including 50 Best Architectural Firms in 2020 by Domus, Rice Design Alliance Spotlight Award, the RAIC Emerging Architectural Practice Award, WAN 21 for 21, Architectural League of NY Emerging Voices, and the Design Vanguard Issue for Architectural Record. In 2012, 546 represented Canada at the Venice Biennale in Architecture, and in 2013, they were selected as the re recipient of the Prix de Rome Award in Architecture for Canada by the Canada Council for the Arts. 5468796 is led by Herm with Colin Neufeld and Sasha Radulovich. In addition to practice, Johanna is an activist and advocate, having initiated, co-created, and spearheaded a number of design-related events and programs, including Table for 12 plus 1200, Chair Your Idea, Design Quarter Winnipeg, and Walk Winnipeg. She is past chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce, currently on the executive board of RAIC Architecture Canada, and a member of the International Council of the New York-based Van Allen Institute. In 2019, she was named visiting professor Morgan Stern Chair of the College of Architecture, IIT Chicago, and most recently, 
she was invited to teach at Cornell University as the Gensler visiting critic. She has also taught design at the University of Manitoba, Toronto, and Montreal. Johanna lectures extensively and is co-author of Innovative Solutions for Creating Sustainable Cities 2018 and Platform Middle Housing for the 99% to be published in 2023. She will be discussing the firm's practice ethos, which spreads far beyond the traditional practice models, necess necessitating an understanding of how the architect's role in challenging contexts must increasingly intersect with politics, economics, social activism, and other forms of cultural and scholarly research and pragmatic engagement. Thank you, Johanna. We look forward to learning about your work. All right, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Terry, for inviting me. I really appreciate being here, and it's such a rare treat to um, to be able to do this in person for for the longest time now. Um, so, a little introduction to our office. And again, I'm trying to cover a few things. Uh, I hope I can keep on time, but I'll do my best. So, we began in 2007, which seems incredibly 15 years ago already. Feels like yesterday, but. Um, and I'm one of the co-founders with my partner, Sasha. Um, and I think what we started with was uh, this idea that we were going to fight ambivalence about architecture and, and, you know, people's sort of perception that they didn't really know what it is and what it would do for them and, and so on. Um, and you'll see that theme come up later. Um, just a little bit about Winnipeg, if there's international students or you might not know, but uh, Winnipeg is in the center of Canada, in the center of actually... Uh, North America geographically, uh, weirdly enough, and it's pretty isolated. Our closest big city is Minneapolis, which is eight hours south uh, by car. Um, and of course, it is sort of mid mid um, uh, west kind of a, a place where there's no geographic boundaries. It's continental climate um, and sprawl is, you know, one of our biggest issues. We're a car city. Um, there were three really kind of uh, uh, high architecture periods we would like to think. Uh, in Winnipeg, um, or we're, we're hoping that we're experiencing the third one now, but, you know, that's optimistic, perhaps. Um, anyway, the first one was sort of turn of the 19th to 20th century, uh, where Winnipeg was really the gateway to the West, and a lot of uh, immigrants and, and goods were going through uh, Winnipeg until the Panama Canal opened in the 1920s, and then that kind of killed the, the optimism and the, and the flow of uh, resources and money into the city. And secondly, the modernist period uh, where uh, John Russell uh, migrated up from Chicago and brought this great architectural tradition to, to Winnipeg. Um, oftentimes, um, we're asked uh, this. I'm an immigrant from Helsinki, Finland. As an, uh, I came over as a high school exchange student to Manitoba. Serendipitously, you pick Canada and that's where you end up. And my, my co-founder, Sasha, is a war refugee from the former Yugoslavia. So... We sort of didn't uh, really get a choice in that. We ended up in Winnipeg and uh, have embraced it, though, ever since. And we think there's certain things that come out of Winnipeg um, that is something to do with isolation that gets a, as a really quick feedback loop on what we do and, um, and what the outcomes are and how we can improve ourselves. And of course, this is maybe a slight exaggeration, 35 to 35 maybe is more accurate on a regular basis, but huge temperature swings terrible soil conditions. So we spend most of our effort as architects in the envelope building, you know, 12 layers of stuff that, you know, keeps the weather out. And then on the ground, 30% of our budgets go into the foundation because everything has to be on piles, every little house and so forth. But what it does for you is that it teaches you um, kind of look at things through the lens of bare minimum and what's necessary and what makes projects robust. And so that's how we sort of tend to Think about architecture, and that's how we learn to think about it, I guess, early on. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of many people who've been through our practice, of course. So I just want to recognize the fact that um, that you know uh, projects are not single-handedly produced. It's a it's a team effort always, and so just wanted to keep that in mind. Um, I think Will asked me originally that I would talk about a little bit broader, and it makes sense now. I'm hearing that that is the theme of the. Uh, the term, but uh, what we've coined as practice ecosystem. And in our minds, it just means that there are a lot of little uh, petals that, of, of practice that go into it that are far outside of the traditional lane of architecture. So it's sort of collaborations, it's design competitions, it's juries, it's design giving, it's academic pursuits, it's exhibitions, it's writing and sort of thought leadership, I suppose, through that political pursuits. I think more architects should be in politics. Um, 
Uh, we participate in awards and publications for the reasons that we get work that way and it gives us further opportunities. Uh, we believe it's our duty and our responsibility to be design activists and, and advocate for the value of design. Um, and all of that, of course, is enabled by financial you know, success, which I'm going to touch on. It's weird, often frowned upon even to talk about it, but I will talk about money. So wait for that. Um, and then, of course, all that boils down to then the practice that we get to have um, as, a, as a result of that. Um, and I, I think we're sort of at the crossroads where, at least in our practice, we've been sort of trying to pursue, I don't know what you would call sort of critical architecture, pursue. I mean, I'm not saying we're doing, that's not for me to judge, but trying to pursue that. And yet today, I sort of think that maybe the architect's role has become more strategic and architects need to be such strategists. Um, and we have to deal with inequality. We have to deal with the climate crisis. We have to deal with the housing crisis much more acutely perhaps than we ever really sort of gave it credit for before. Um, and so whatever that takes, um, re-examine and rewriting regulatory and fiscal policies should sort of be, go hand in hand with all of that. But so from the conception of the firm, we focused on the missing middle, not because we chose it, but because it came to us. We got a 30 unit housing project on our first year that we were out of um, out of the gates. And um, it sort of began to shape us more than we we got to shape it in the in the beginning, as we as we say. Um, and we started very local, of course, to, to Winnipeg and have since then expanded um, now in the last five to seven years to Calgary, Edmonton, Surrey, Victoria, Saskatoon, Regina, and Halifax, um, and a little bit in Toronto. We had a couple of substantial projects here, but right now the one project we have going on is installation at the, at the Bentway, um, hoping to complete that um, in the spring. So um, we are also compiling all of that we've learned in this housing business into a book, and, and, and more on that later, but through that effort recently, uh, tried to summarize the number of homes that, um, or units or suites that have passed through our desk. And um, yeah, you can see that it sort of includes anything from a couple, a handful to, to um, uh, more than 1,000 in, in a project. And so, um, yeah, just to sort of give you a sense. So back to the idea of ambivalence. Um, one noticeable difference um, I have experienced coming to Canada from, from Finland was the, and especially in Winnipeg, was the uh, sort of the public appreciation of architecture that seemed to be lacking over here. And it was indicative, and the reason I have this up is this was the money that we used back then, the Finnish mark, uh, which had Alvar Aalto on the cover and Finlandia Hall. And so the fact that it wasn't the prime minister or a queen or a president was sort of indicative of how much value we placed on, on design and architecture. And it was a true shift coming here um, when people would be much more excited about talking about their car and what kind of turbo motor was on it or whatever it was back in the 90s when Will and I went to school together. Anyway, um, but what we noticed early on, this is one of our very first sort of really public projects. Um, it was a little band shell uh, replacing an old band shell from the 70s at the center of our historic core in Winnipeg. You can see the old stage uh, right in the black and white image there in the top corner. Uh, and we won sort of a mini competition with this idea that it should be uh, an object um, that never feels empty uh, when, there's no, um, when there's no event on it. Um, it was empty 321 days of the year, only 44 days of the year. It had something for half an hour on it. And so the, this idea came that, you know, it would be this complete object, uh, this little cube that would hibernate or would have lights and would maybe have sound when there wasn't a live performance. And um, through projecting serendipitously through um, Venetian blinds, we discovered that an image transfers to uh, that sort of arrangement, like on Venetian blinds to the other side. And it became this poor man's pixelated screen. At the time, LED lights and all that business was not very common and it was super expensive. And this was sort of um, a rudimentary version of how you could do that. And we had a projector inside, which again, the aluminum screen, 20,000 pieces worked as a, worked as a, um, a vandal proof um, kind of curtain around it as well. Anyway, um, now there are um, four times the events every year, um, nearly 200 days, uh, it's busy. And weirdly enough, 
I mean, excluding the pandemic, of course, but really enough, it's, it's one of the more popular places to take your wedding photos. Um, I don't know why. The reason I'm telling this story, though, is that um, at the time when it came out, people absolutely had an opinion. They either hated this thing. There was a hate group on Facebook. Now this dates me again, but, you know, like tear down the cube. Um, and then, then we also got all kinds of awards for it and architectural recognitions for it. And, um, and you know, we got hate mail. It was, it was just, but what was great about it is that people actually cared. Nobody had not had opinion about it. And um, that was sort of really a, a, a eye-opening event for us. Um, and we thought, okay, there's something there that we can, we can do things that make people talk. And that's, you know, the first step. So back to that ecosystem, competition is obviously an important part way to sort of measure yourself against what's going on in the world. I mentioned um, sort of publications, and this has sort of worked in a way that it's not necessarily supposed to be about vanity, but about getting further opportunities. And one of our biggest clients came through that, that we were published in an en route magazine, like out of all things, um, on the Air Canada flight magazine. And and so the call came from there, or we got one of our clients from Instagram. Um, so it's it's sort of like you do these things for 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 those reasons, and of course, being on juries or or doing exhibitions and things like that sort of a similar purpose of understanding what's going on in the world and and kind of measuring yourself against that. But um, one of the early major efforts that um, we took in sort of this trying to create design culture was our participation in the, the 2012 Venice Biennale in Architecture and. Um, we, uh, we won the com commission, I guess, of, with this idea that um, we would do, instead of just going to Venice, we would do seven, eight, how many is it? Oh, I forget now. Um, but across Canada, sort of competition for young architects to um, put their thoughts forward onto sort of um, armature that we, we built. And it wasn't about the exhibition so much as it was about trying to figure out the funding model for the Canada's participation to the Biennale was that was really ultimately the outcome. So we ended up collecting six hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars for the million dollar project that it that it ended up being with all of the hurdles that you go through uh, and a sort of a two year project. But um, but again, that that idea that if you actually have a presence in Canada before you go some to some remote country, um, as the locals here would think, people would actually be able to you know, see the value of, of putting their sponsorship dollars forward. And so that's it. But there's obviously different ways to think about all this. Um, what it got to for us is gave an opportunity for 30, our, our compatriots to go to Venice and, and for us to meet everybody who had money across the country and all the connectors and professors and smart people around the country. So it gave us a lot of those networking opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, exhibitions like we um, do a lot of custom details and, and we've had exhibitions around this, hoping to still take it to a few other places. Um, we work with local fabricators and so on. Um, maybe not important. Try to participate in all kinds of design events, uh, invent them, uh, host them, um, including on the boards, which is kind of like studio for practitioners. You meet over beers and you critique each other's work so that hopefully the bar uh, rises uh, as a result. You've heard about the warming huts. We were part of the original group that started it with Peter Hargraves um, at the Forks and, and it's still going on today. And I think Toronto is copying it with their warming stations. So that's ultimate compliment. Um, 2013, um, as uh, was mentioned, we, uh, we, are, we were lucky enough to receive the Prix de Rome with the project where we po proposed to have dinner with um, in um, seven cities across the world with important people. Um, I still can't believe that they bought this, but the, but the idea was that we would learn from good architecture cultures or what seemingly work in architecture cultures, what makes it work, um, who are the instigators, what maintains it, and bring those lessons back to Canada. And so as you can see, some of the places that we were at, so we had politicians, we had planners, we had clients, we had or developers, we had uh, architects obviously part of these discussions and, and organizations that had something to do with media personnel and so on. Um, and it was really interesting. All lessons were different and actually yeah, Will hosted us in, in, in Tokyo, of course. Um, so counting on the existing uh, connections. Um, and then that culminated to Table for 1200 um, in 2014, which also was the host of the RAC Festival. 
Um, and it was uh, us trying to blow this up in Winnipeg so that we would have 1,200 uh, people, ordinary Winnipeggers, coming for dinner and talking about design issues. And, um, you know, uh, it was organizational nightmare um, in terms of the tables and chairs and things like that. And, and again, not any sort of a big money maker, obviously. These are what we call the lose your shirt projects. But what they do is they build this culture. And, um, and sure enough, today, uh, our advocacy organization in Winnipeg, Storefront Manitoba, runs it as a, still as an annual event now, uh, as a charitable um, you know, uh, event for them to fund their programs. So goal was very much achieved there. Cherry Idea was, a, uh, was this um, crowdsourced, uh, you know, you participate for 25 bucks, you write our urban design idea, guerrilla idea, kind of on a Twitter length uh, tweet, and uh, you put it on a chair. And then at the end of it, the mayor uh, over there, Mayor Bowman, got a thousand urban design ideas, and we got to realize one with the, with the participating monies. Um, again, so that we would have further discussions, people would care about what design actually does. Uh, another similar activism project was um, one bucket at the time. Uh, so we were invited to do a pavilion at Mextropoli, which is the Latin America's largest architectural uh, conference in Mexico City every year. Uh, fabulous event, by the way, if you ever have the opportunity to go, all kinds of superstars speak there. Um, so anyway, but um, we had some friends in, in Mexico City. Oopsie, I should push the next slide. And this was inspired by, oh, did I just, I thought, okay. Anyway, sorry, I'm messing up. Um, but anyway, it's um, it's ordinary painter's buckets that, um, that um, yeah, um, people called Vienna Vienna, they're, they're entrepreneurs, they're local entrepreneurs. So what they do is they take ordinary painter's buckets and claim public space with them um, and then charge, uh, you know, for parking stalls and charge money for those parking stalls. And the police is in on this as sort of a corrupt little ring. Um, and uh, the idea was that we could somehow with the same object claim the public space back. Um, so this became, uh, you know, an installation pavilion for three days. The the buckets were sort of roped together on the back of them, relying on their um, slightly slanted uh, face as sort of a, a way to way to curve that. And and the reason I'm again talking about this is that we had an opportunity to actually bring it back to Winnipeg uh, for the design festival and um, and built it again there. And um, the idea there was that Winnipeggers then could purchase a bucket or sort of metaphorically at least pur purchase a bucket, bucket and send it back to Mexico City to um, help a local girl orphanage. Um, so we collected $10,000 for the girls. And uh, again, at that point, it felt like, okay, we're actually doing something real that's helping people more concretely. It's not just about the design culture as much as it's also like reaching a little bit deeper um into that um and I, I promise i will show you some projects as well <laughs> this is the other stuff uh design quarter is something that we started in 2017 uh, put a business plan together uh, looked at you know other cities that have design districts and so forth uh looked at what already existing uh entities makers uh local craftsmen there were how we could help their business um then went door knocking to get the money together for the startup. And it's, it's really a collective um, promotional program for them. It's a collective marketing that would bring people to a walkable district uh, in the core area. So it's also this sort of urban slant of walkability and trying to bring people there and then benefit the local economy. Um, I was on the MAA, so Manitoba Association of Architects board for four years and in there tried to really get People to buy into quality-based selection. Uh, it means that you select architects based on them, their merit and their quality of their work, rather than rather than the fee that they're proposing to do a job for. And and the why that's important, of course, is is that it's not like buying toilet paper. When you procure professional work, you uh, should invest in it so that you get the best possible outcome. We essentially, and you eventually, will sell time and and more time you can spend on a project on the upfront. The you know, the cheaper it is or more uh, the smarter or more uh, sustainable it might be in the future. So it's worth the investment. And 
anyway, these are sort of on the political pursuit side. Um, I also, I, I guess you heard, um, was the chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. It's very rare opportunity for an architect to have a soapbox to which to preach from to the, uh, to the uh, political decision makers and the people with, with cash who will spend it and shape our cities and so on. And so I was really trying to, usually this is a position where you kind of are the figurehead and you go and you open events and you speak at luncheons for three minutes to welcome everybody and that sort of thing. But I proposed to them that I would do a little info session for every luncheon where there's thousand business people in the audience and say, and, and put it in numbers, like what good urban design could do for you. What In this case, walkability, this was one of the little sessions. So it speak really fast and like spew out these numbers on how you know, it's actually better for your uh, return on investment uh, to invest in bikes and it's better for um, reducing crime and travel times and all of that to uh, pedestrianize streets uh, in this case. And interesting facts like um, if you spend more than 45 minutes in your car, you Torontonians probably do, um, you're 40% more likely to get a divorce. Like it's, it's stuff like this that really gets people ultimately. Um, or that, you know, you have, you walk just 15 minutes a day and you reduce, reduce your risk of dying by 22% if you're over 60, um, and so on. So this is sort of span into me then becoming this person talking about how we should design our city differently. Um, you look at the light blue there, you can see how Winnipeg's footprint, um, we're one of the least dense cities in the world, um, not a great stat. Uh, if we were to build to the density of Paris, which again is not Tokyo, doesn't have tall buildings, you know, all that, we would fit in that 35 square kilometers, so seven and a half percent of the size. So you can imagine if if cities' budgets, um, you know, we're broke. Almost all cities are broke across North America. 70% of our budget goes into something um, that's directly linked to distance. So meters of pipe, you know. Um, meters of road or kilometers of road and so on. And, and so we could save a massive amount of money if we just directed our future growth to the inner city. So I've been trying to get this across. We just had a municipal election. I know you had one too. And to talk to the mayoral candidates about this directly. Um, there's a great study um, from the University of Ottawa, I want to say. Anyway, that in Halifax, they looked at this and it, it's actually $2,000 cheaper per household to service from public money, from your tax money in the city, um, uh, an urban household versus a suburban household. So in Winnipeg, this would mean that over the next 25 years, even just if we just put our newcomers into the inner city and built density, we would save over $4 billion. $4 billion. And our infrastructure de deficit is $7 billion. Okay, I could go on. Sorry. Um, so anyway, um, and then when we think about housing, which is you know close to us and what we do, it's one of the biggest, it's, it's commodified, as you would know in Toronto again, um, real estate is about um, $217 trillion, like the value of local real estate. 60% of that is, uh, or sorry, over 75% is, is in residential real estate. And so you can understand, hopefully, why we have a housing crisis, because we use it as, a, as an investment tool. Um, the average North American also occupies about four times of the space that the average um, Asian or uh, twice as much as, as an average European in personal footprint in our homes. I know Toronto is not necessarily guilty of that, but we certainly out in the West are. And so it's a really important metric when we think about sustainable future and how we should live and what we should be building. Also, um, when we think about affordability, here's a shocking statistics. In Canada, um, only about 4% of the entire housing stock is public housing, so social housing, supported housing compared to some of the Northern European countries, for example, Denmark or the Netherlands, where that those percentages are 24 and 32. So, and in the US it's even worse, it's 0.7% of the total housing stock is, is um, public. So something has to change. Um, we used to be better in the seventies, we built a lot more social housing in, in Canada and it's been declining ever since. Um, so as a result of this year at the chamber, we then invited Jan Gill to come and speak at the at the at one of the chamber luncheons. It was a, as a big success and sold out room and and the chamber ended up issuing a, a policy paper to the government on on how we should be building in the future. So I was pretty proud of that. Anyway, 
back to you know sort of more architecture stream and um, a couple of really important lessons that we learned early on in our practice one was that we had to look at everything in terms of numbers before we would have a conversation about architecture and it was a really a good learning thing early on we had this developer this is our first housing project that i mentioned the 30 units um and that developer really honed that in on us and we still have his performance sheet so for an architect to be able to do the performance sheet from the get-go and understand that everything that you get to do in architecture is after when you realize the sort of the profit or the financial case for it is, is the reality today. Maybe we can change that in the future, but at least for today, if we were to operate to carve architecture out of the equation, you have to understand that first part. Um, and so that was a good lesson. And I think that sort of gave us wings in the, in the beginning. Um, the second part that took me about five years to realize I was doing a Pachakcha, um, how do I say that, Bill? Is that right? Something like that. Um, uh, lecture. And um, I sort of was trying to think of something like isn't about showing a project and so on. And then sort of dawned on me that what we've been doing early on in all of our projects is we sort of embedding this public space in between the multifamily housing. And um, and this, these are the places that I grew up in. Like I'm in there, like number three uh, on the, in the ski competitions. But in between buildings, we would have yard space that was shared. And our identity was tied to it. I would say that I'm from that yard in our language, as opposed to from the buildings. And so also shows you the value of that shared community. Um, and then when I compared that to where I first lived uh, in Winnipeg, at the same space, as you can see, is prioritized for the car and the garbage can. So again, there's a lot of work that we can figure out how to how to shift our thinking. And we've been trying to do that. We don't get paid to do that, but we certainly can have an impact on how projects get organized and what the space so-called leftover can do for us. And today we believe that the multi, in order for us to have more multifamily housing and make it a viable lifelong uh, way to live is to have these spaces, to prioritize these spaces because they are what where you know your identity is formed for me anyway, when we grew up and for Sasha too. Anyway, um, about practicing in Winnipeg, <laughs> there's also this, this thing that you can't afford much more than the rudimentary materials. Here's your choices. You got uh, stucco, you got cementitious board, which is, you know, sort of a composite material and then sort of corrugated metal or metal product. And that's, you know, where you get to pick from. We don't get to do brick. We don't get to do masonry. We don't get to do whatever other fancy stuff might, out, might be out there. So everything that, you know, um, you have to understand that that's kind of like the baseline that, or that is the top line, I should say, where you get to start. But the projects that I'm showing today um, are along uh, our river. Um, so we are sitting at the confluence of two rivers. I should have done a land acknowledgement in the beginning anyway, but used to be a, uh, indigenous land here. Um, and since then, weirdly enough, we've built or are in the process of building quite a few projects along, um, along the waterfront in, in Winnipeg. Um, and the first one, I, I really don't want to talk to any detail, but just to show you some of the sense of where things have gone over the over the last 15 years, uh, was this was called U-Cube. Now, again, you can see how old I am from here, but we were in studio teaching at the U of M, and uh, this was the time that the iPods came out. Oops, is it not moving? Oh, it is moving. Okay, um, and so the idea was that, you know, could you do sort of a simple shell and then yet have your your identity, like your individual identity within it. It was an industrial strip, a uh, pretty bleak place. And um, our client came to us, he's a young guy. I don't think he was 30 yet by then, but his dad had been in the business um, and, or in business. So he had some startup money and so on. And he had bought this uh, site that was 263 by 64 feet or something like that. And he wanted to build you know, 18, 20 units on it. And pretty early on, we discovered that he'd been in a custom house building. Um, you know, that's what he'd been doing before. So he had access to those trades and he knew how to build houses, but he didn't necessarily know how to build bigger projects. So pretty quickly, then it turned into us, you know, organizing it into 18 um, individual iPods or cubes, and then putting the parking uh, under a plaza that was six feet off the ground. Uh, so you can see here, and then on the front of that, there were some commercial suites or there were some flex spaces that could be turned into commercial suites. Um, and then um, this was also a building code thing where you could build um, three stories only, but the fourth story would be at just a basement if it was 
it was sunken in the ground by two feet. So maximum it could be up was, um, you know, about six feet and so on, which also gave you a sense of a bit of security. It was in tr transitional areas. I said the plaza doubled as the covered parking area, and then the units were above and sort of vertically organized. And then we had this pretty, uh, and then culminating to rooftops where we'd have a sort of a community, another community space where you could, uh, you know, at least talk to your neighbor across the um, balcony there. And then this pretty naive idea about reconfiguring how a living should happen. It's a living strip. And we coiled it up in there. And <laughs> we felt pretty proud that, you know, whenever it sort of touched the edge of the box, then that becomes a window. And so nothing was arbitrary that it was sort of a result of this equation. I don't know how valid any of that. It felt it feels a bit sort of forced right now, but uh, you can see sort of what kind of spaces uh, were generated. Moving on from there, um, you know, this project started early on 62M. It took about five years for us to get um, off the ground. There were all kinds of twists and turns. Um, same developer in part, he, he had a partner. He came to us and he said, I have this leftover piece of land next to, um, Industri or industrial sheds, the back of industrial sheds, the project that we built uh, before. So the backs of those, they're on a property line, so no windows there. And then an elevated highway, and there's really no street frontage. And he asked us, can we make housing work over here? Um, and, uh, you know, trying to be, again, hyper-rational about it and follow sort of what the project is telling us to do. I think we sort of landed on the idea that it has to be off the ground. You have to overcome the views and that you can, you know, this was condo still at the time. So you can see out uh, further from there. We took a sort of a cherry picker bucket, like the cheap man's version again of, you know, drone shots at the time where actually you climbed in the construction bucket and took these pictures for the realtors. And anyway, but the genesis of the form was not because we thought it would, would be cool as a sort of a round thing, but because we had to now pay for the fact that it was up in the air, which is more costly to build. And, um, and we tried to convince the builders that, you know, once you have this platform up in the air, then it's a really a simple construction from there. In fact, uh, this was a three-story building under the building code um, so that you could build it out of wood. Um, taller wood buildings weren't allowed at the time. And, the, and when we studied the shape, we could realize that the efficiency, actually the amount of envelope and the amount of units that you get was 30% better when you went, went the sort of the round way, because now you have the exposure by your corridor, which is, you know, doesn't generate rent or, or revenue, is shorter. And then that splay out gives you more um, face to the building. And then um, it was sort of a combo. So the core where the stairs and the elevators are and the, and the main pillars uh, holding it up were concrete. And then we had the steel ring uh, the columns are also shaped sort of in a radial format uh, from the center to lighten their their appearance. Um, yeah, I won't go into that. They were prefabbed offsite uh, in a shop. And so we had this Ferris field built and then basically putting plywood on top of that and starting to build as if you're on the ground. Uh, it was built as an element. So we had two by walls, just two by six walls, just tilted up. Uh, same thing with uh, with floors and and roof assemblies, um, as you see there. So it was erected only in four weeks um, as, a, as a result of that. Um, and then you can see the sort of central um, beam me up kind of a arrangement. But an important thing to remember that in Winnipeg, as in out in the West, spaces are big, yards are big, we sprawl out. And uh, when we look at what we used to spend uh, in terms of our footprint per person, in North America, it was around 290 square feet per person on average uh, in the 1950s, and we're over 900 square feet now. So every project we've done in the multifamily realm, we've been trying to convince people that, look, they can actually live with less if we design well, so let's invest into the, into the quality as opposed to the quantity of space. Um, I should have, uh, so you can see, oh, uh, hopefully it's not too loud. This is our project architect, Ken, walking through the suite that he lived in near the kids' get in the background, but lived in one of these units, um, the bed space just right there. And then um, you can sort of see how they're pie shaped. So all the, all the utilities on the back and it opens out at the front. And um, that was sort of the main idea of it. Um, we also had a different type of, uh, so that's sort of the base suite and a different type of suite when, 
Uh, when I was single a few years back yet, I built this for myself and it's more like everything. It's the same pie shape and everything um, is behind one wall. And so the bathroom, everything goes in there and uh, you get this sort of big open space, 610 square feet for each pie. Um, and oopsie idea was to sort of, I, you know, obviously I'm a fan of baths. So there you go. Uh, it's sitting out in there, but there's a wall that comes out and you can close it in for privacy and so on. And kitchen kind of hides behind there and same thing with the bathroom and this thing folds out further. But anyway, so it was kind of uh, an experiment again, how you can think about maybe space differently, how if you have a deep footprint in your plan, how you can make that work and, and get quality out of it. But also what you'll notice in housing design, and maybe you have already, if you've been part of a housing studio, oops, is this working? Um, is that oftentimes what we end up is vertical strips of windows where you have a living room and then you have bedrooms and you have a living room, and you have bedrooms, and that's what you're stuck with because you have to make the plumbing line up and you have to make sense of the, the guts of it. Uh, and you can't just frivolously flip things around. And so it was, became really important for us to, in, even in this case, to try to find those commonalities so that we would end up with the, with the strip facade, but that we would actually sort of be able to blend it in. The other thing about this project is that nothing other than Sana and Japan gets to, or nobody, I should say, gets to build out of curved glass. So, you know, building round things isn't exactly a sort of a Winnipeg thing that you can get away with. And so everything's faceted and you have to work hard to hide that because uh, it, you know, building materials are flat. Um, so we built these fins and then flipped the units, as you saw there with common sort of plumbing runs within them to kind of hide that faceting. And I think now when you look at the building from the outside, you can't necessarily tell that it's, you know, the, the windows are straight and so forth. Um, should be able to walk through here and then the corridor is open air now we're in Winnipeg and but and people may may think that this is weird it does get pretty windy there in the winter sometimes but when you think about it, it's no different than you having entering your house uh so why would you have to have a warm corridor because it actually saves a lot of capital costs it saves a lot of operational costs ultimately and 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 creates affordability through through that um, and then funny story about this, and I'm going to totally run out of time to say anything reasonable, and this is taking me way too long. But um, what, I, what I did want to conclude with is that there is also in this particular um, project a, a, an interesting little detail at the top, which is that um, during, the, during the commission, the developer at some point owed us a bunch of money. And he had no way of paying it. And uh, as it happens oftentimes with young developers and, um, and we bargained to buy the roof of the, um, the roof rights to the elevator and stair core. So about 400 square foot bit. And, and then we ended up building it um, as a sort of a caretaker suite, which fits under the building code still stayed as a three-story building. And now it's, um, it's a, a visitor suite. So if you come to Winnipeg and you're there for a, a good purpose, uh, like visiting to see the city or, or whatever, um, in an official capacity or you're an artist that needs an accommodation, then we, uh, we let you use it for free. Otherwise, it's on Airbnb, so we, we pay the bills. Um, but anyway, so we've had lots of people actually visit from the architectural community and from the art community. It's got some films that have been filmed in there and it gives you a great sort of view of the of the city. So this is part of the sort of giving back. So having a business model that's self-generating that allows us to um, give back to the, uh, the arts community. Um, so there you go. So anyway, but a uh, pretty sort of rough array. There's lots of stories here. I won't go into all of them. Um, that's part of it. Uh, we also put this container in on our own cost into, uh, into the uh, Bijou Park, which is near the cube that I showed you earlier. It now functions as, um, and, and we built the, um, the slats and made it sort of function fairly cheaply. And, and it serves as a pop-up um, place and, and a bar occasionally and has had different um, uh, different events and and the uh, and the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation also utilized it as their as their venue location uh, in all of this of course what we always try to do too is in the office is to try to think about so 
okay, so we're, we should have a good business so that we can get future opportunities. And also we should be fair to the people that work with us. Uh, and the students out there, I want to say, please don't ever work without overtime pay. Uh, don't, you know, value yourself. We all have to value our profession. It starts with, with, you know, all of us, we're part of the equation. So uh, let's demand better. Let's demand more on that. Um, we can do our job better and help the world better if we're if we're reasonably compensated for what we do. So anyway, uh, so there's a list we we made includes now sabbatical plan um, and incentive plan. So our our people share in the profits. Every every intern, every um, junior designer, and so forth. We have hundred percent transparent in-house financials, so everybody knows where the money goes exactly to a penny. We do quarterly reviews. Um, the only thing that we don't know about each other is what you know what the salaries are. Um, as that would be not okay, perhaps with other people. Anyway, um, and so as part of that, then we do an incentive uh, plan. So what it means is that we have a certain amount of money. We have sort of a stretch target financially that we try to achieve every year. And we've done this for nine years now. It's worked out. There's no payout if we don't reach the targets. So everybody's accountable and everybody shares in that equally. So Again, I scratched the names out here, but here's one year sort of total. So in addition to your regular salary and your overtime pay and your benefits and all these other things, you get this lump sum of money. If we do well, then you do well uh, working there. And, and I've just sort of looked at the history. It's, it swang anywhere from 21,000 per year to about 5,000 per year. So um, it sort of increased everybody's pay about five and, a, and change over on average over those over those nine years. Uh, and we also tried to give uh, or we give back to uh, design uh, related things. So we have a person in the office who who runs this, um, you know, so if you have an event and you want to apply to uh, get funded, then we have $20,000 a year. We should probably increase that. But $20,000 a year is the current amount that we give away to um, uh, student projects or, or anything that people come up with. And yeah, we don't necessarily give to cancer or things like that because we thought, you know, prior to all of the sort of homelessness crisis and so on that nobody else will give the design. So we should. Um, and that was kind of our mantra and that's our corporate giving policy. Um, a few years back then 2019, we, I ripped off this idea proudly from Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, which, because they encouraged it, um, that um, you can do this walk sign strategy that you put walking signs up, you measure how much it takes to walk, how many minutes it takes to walk from one place to another. Don't ask any permissions, just go put the signs up. So we did this as an office and and it was, it was fun. Um, it took the city about two months to figure out who's behind it. CBC wrote about it. There was all kinds of discussion on social media about like what's going on, where did these come from? And then I got this email from, David Patman, who's the manager in transportation at the city of Winnipeg, sort of coyly asking, like, I've heard you've been doing this and is it true? And can we meet? And I, I first thought that they want to fine us because it's actually legal to put signs up. But it turns out that he wanted to make them permanent, um, but that he's, his department was split. One half wanted to just nail us to the wall and, and the other half uh, was for it um, as something that we should do to encourage walkability. Uh, and then lastly, I guess, uh, the office side. So we also believe in this osmosis learning that happens through the desk. So you hear a senior architect talk on the phone with the, with a the client or contractor, then you learn that way. And similarly, we host the uh, Winnipeg Architecture Foundation because they have sort of a storefront activity. They sell merchandise and so on um, so that we would be more vibrant to the street, uh, host the design board of Winnipeg in our space. Um, storefront from Manitoba was there for a while when they were um, in transition, um, some of our developers have come and shared on the table so that we all learn by working together. Um, do I have time for, I would like to do one more project, perhaps. Do I have time for that still? Yeah, okay. All right, so um, the next project that's nearly complete, uh, all phases, there's three phases, it's called Pump House. And this is um, a historic, uh, James Avenue pumping station that you see here, one story building um, that was conceived after the great Chicago fire in Winnipeg was 
uh, uh, these pumps were housed in there that pulled water from the river and were able to suppress the, if there was a fire within the downtown Winnipeg. Fortunately, it was never needing to be used, um, but the motors and, and gears that are in there are built by the same company as the Titanic motors. Um, and so they were very sort of historically valuable, I guess. Um, however, it's been, it was, um, it was about to be demolished somehow. I don't know how that would have happened with historic, but because nobody could make sense of the development cost of this, this was sort of seen as a, um, a drain. Uh, you'd have to put a million dollars or I don't know, million dollars, uh, several million dollars into the building before you could actually make sense of it. So it was kind of a drain and we tried to put together a performa, we approached a developer that we know and also realized that the foundations that were not able to carry any further load, which you would have to have to, to have a floor in here to have a usable space. Um, but we realized that the cantry grains that were there that were able to move those motors in and out and for them to be serviced actually had a load capacity already on them. And we talked to our structural engineer who said, yeah, that's true. Um, and then we were able to put about 15,000 uh, square feet of uh, developable um, space or commercial space into the pump house, elevated above the pump, so on, attached to that country grain. Um, and then the second part of the equation uh, was the realization that there's a 40-foot strip, which is pretty narrow for housing development, in the front of the pump house. And, and all the developments up until now, and there had been over a dozen of them prior to us that that had failed uh, for not making financial sense, um, we're only utilizing the back portion uh, of the site. And so once we figured how to build on the front side, and um, and then in addition to the commercial um, commercial space that we were able to get, all of a sudden it started to uh, started to make sense on the spreadsheet. And you can see painfully slowly here this uh, coming up, but. Um, and so they would be sort of this combo project that include the adaptive reuse of the pump house and then two new new buildings that in, es in essence that contained 93 housing units. Um, and and uh, two levels, one and a half levels of underground parking. So those are the, the housing bits. And as with the previous project 62M that you saw, um, we also proposed to put the corridors on the outside to save money to allow for um, to phased access or so through units that we don't often get because we have to have two exits in our North American building code standards and limits the creativity and limits sort of livability that uh, you can you can pull out of the projects. Um, anyway, I'm trying to get this to move faster, but there's this way of showing you, I guess, how this works. There's an elevator that's in indoors, of course. Elevators can't be outside in Winnipeg. And then there's this... Uh, shared um, uh, walkways on the on the two back buildings and the single loaded situation on the front. And then you can see the commercial space kind of tying into it. And so in addition to all of the building components, of course, there's interesting spaces. There's sort of a plaza in the front and so forth uh, that gets left over our interest in, the, in creating these little nuggets of urban rooms uh, in cities. And um, ah, it's not moving fast enough. Maybe I should. Just pop out of here. And then you can see the Titanic tanks. And then uh, we also designed the space uh, with pretty rudimentary materials. This is, you know, uh, off the shelf um, uh, light gauge uh, studs that are just painted black, uh, kind of go with the with the aesthetic of the existing building and, and leaving that as, as an you know, untouched as, as sort of possible. And then having these peaks through where you can see the pumps and where there are skylights that we had to cut through to get some light into the deep floor plate. Um, so that's sort of the final uh, outcome of the, of that. Um, I'm gonna try and move on from here if possible. You can you can tell that I didn't do the video part. I don't quite know how the, <laughs> but again, it's not talking about sort of this rudimentary materials that were used to steel deck with a poured concrete floors, um, and so on. Shoot, I'm trying to make it move faster. It's not cooperating.
goodness gracious. Okay, we've got that back. Should I pop out of here? I don't know how the videoing, maybe I'll just keep pretending that I do want to talk about this further. But um, so the units themselves are, I hope we get to that quickly here, but the units themselves are built, um, built as 40 by approximately 40 by 15 foot wide symbol tunnels, uh, basically piercing from one face of the building to the other. And um, we also deploy things like a skip stop corridor here it means that you have to build that corridor only every second floor. So that saves cost again. And then you uh, enter um, at, you know, flat onto one unit and you go up the stairs to the second unit. And again, you have the double aspect so you can have um, true bedroom um, even in this narrow space. And the why that 15 foot was important is because again, these were prefab and used nail laminated timber meaning nail laminated actually two by sixes as the floor um, uh, floor and, and, and ceiling. And you could actually leave them exposed because two inches of that is not structurally required. So two by four would have done the job, but when they're laminated together um, with nails like that, um, the underside of a two by six can char. Um, so you can lose two inches of that in a fire and it still would give you the same fire resistance rating as a, as a dry vault um, ceiling. And you know, here we are sort of traveling through that. We use corrugated, simple corrugated perforated metal as, as guardrails. And, and so you can sort of see through, but again, sort of the, the mass of the building expressed through these stairs um, um, and, um, and corridors that um, are sort of uh, attached to the face of it. And again, taking quite a bit of pride into the fact that we do work with the local fabricators and we understand what construction costs are. And that often allows us to leverage whatever little room there is, wiggle room to try to get projects um, uh, built uh, in a sort of, with more architecture embedded into them, so to speak. And um, hopefully I will, as we're like walking through the stairs here, it allows me to somehow move forward. It did, and phase two is happening currently. All right, um, so teaching you heard about, we did that quite a bit. We were at IIT, we've always taught students uh, about performance. So they actually had to calculate their own performance when they were in school. They had to understand what, when they add cool space and that's kind of uh, extra, that it, it costs extra so that we learn to be accountable for it from early on. We also thought details, so you had to do build one-to-one -one details of some of your key decisions in the in the projects and then uh, the same thing carried through to um, this is a student project from Cornell from last term again the performer was actually part of the final presentation even they had to go through it and understand what their cap rates were and all kinds of fun stuff that seems intimidating but I think will be very valuable hopefully for you not to become cynical as you get out in the real world um, and so on so this is one of the one of those projects um, I will just do a little skip through. Uh, we are currently writing a book, uh, as I said, in, um, in all of the housings that we've learned. Uh, it's going to be published in 2023. It's intended to be not about our projects, but about the lessons that we've learned, especially for students and academics and young practitioners, so they don't have to spend 15 years knowing all of this stuff, but they can have a head start and uh, serve the world in a better way. Um, so all that stuff that I very passionately talking about and the challenges that we have. Everything is about money. We have two exit requirements in North America, and we have no public policies to support affordable housing uh, so that we can overcome those somehow. Anyway, um, enough of that. And I will end with, um, I would have loved to have talked about a few more things, but I will end with our Toronto project here. So we were fortunate enough to win this competition for a site at York. Um, so look for Bent Boomtown at Bentway coming up this spring. Um, there are genie lifts that are going to be having googly eyes and are going to be um, traversing around there. And during spring, summer, autumn are going to have different costumes on them. The Halloween one already appeared as a sort of pre-show, but it's officially going to be launched um, in the spring. So thank you very much. So, 
What is the book's name? Sorry. Hmm? What is the book's name? The title. Oh, the book name. Um, I hope this is the final name because we just signed with the with the uh, publisher, but it's uh, Platform Middle, uh, meaning middle middle scale housing um, and housing for the ninety nine percent is the sort of subtitle. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what the significance of the firm's name was. Um, it, it's not significant, um, but it is our um, uh, business incorporation number. So when you go to the company's office and you start a corporation, get this running number. So in Manitoba, it was, you know, on um, May 5th or something of 2007, it was that number. And then uh, our, like, you know, the part of it is that our names are miserable to pronounce. Nobody would know them, and we didn't want it to be our names anyway. Like we, we worked for a guy uh, under a firm whose the, the principal's name was on the or the owner's name was on the on the firm. It never felt like you were part of a team. So our hope was that with the sort of more ubiquitous name, that it would feel like our team is like we're all five for six. Um, and so that was that. And then at the same time, it's sort of the record history when you could get that number. But really, it's about trying to sort of have an equal footing. And um, we have um, like a publicist kind of a, a marketing person, good friend, who was um, a creative director of this, this branding company. And he said to us one day, he said, like, that is the most... Um, that is the worst thing you could have ever done is to have this stupid number because nobody can remember it. And uh, it's just abysmal. And then he said, but somehow it works because everybody remembers that it's some number. They don't have to remember the number. Um, you Google numbered architecture, something you get us, or you Google barcode architecture, you get us. And so, but we are trying to get it as a phone number now. Uh, when we first checked into it, it was, we had to buy 2000 phone numbers, but now there's a different area code under which apparently we can. So that's gonna be the next effort. Um, I'm wondering if you have advice for students to try to integrate that kind of numbers mindset, business mindset at, at the outset and try to bring the architecture out afterwards. I, like, I'm sure it's something you guys kind of developed over time. I'm wondering just about some advice on that. Yeah, um, what, I, what I've noticed is teaching it is that um, often it, it makes you very nervous and it limits you. So I wouldn't want you in, while, while you're in school to not be able to dream big and, and not to be able to develop ideas uh, when you're young that go beyond not being nervous about the number. Um, but at the same time, like I said, I think what it allows you to do when you know those things is, is to be able to be better equipped to challenge the status quo or challenge the uh, your boss or your, your clients um, or provide um, reasonable responses that are within that within that framework so i do think it's it's valuable what you, what could you do you could um certainly reach out to uh developers maybe you could go do a summer um job at a development uh, office as opposed to architectural office i've heard a few people do that um you can email me and i'll send you the performance sheet and <laughs> we can share notes uh, but honestly, it's sort of a one uh, eight and a half by 11 or one sort of strip of some numbers that, you know, once you kind of plug in uh, gross area versus net area, I quickly realize that I have to build all of that gross area. What is my net area? Then I actually realize either in rent or um, or sales value. And, and that's really what it boils down to. Uh, and then understanding that there's all just other costs that go go into it. So if we're going to crack the sort of affordability crisis, even it's important to know. But I I I I know that Cornell, for example, right now having been there just recently, is combining their architecture department um, 
and the real estate department, which is their big thing, uh, into some sort of a super faculty. And they're going to, you can take a minor or a major um, in, you know, one and the other. And I think, again, we're not, tr not trying to promote the idea that we shouldn't, you know, um, advance architecture and sort of like the theory and the thought of architecture and all the great things that we can do. But I also think it's a valuable weapon almost to, kn to know that stuff. So that's why I promote it and that's why I believe in it. And I maybe more schools will do that in the future. Um, so I was I saw that Bentway project and I was just wondering what your inspiration behind that was. It was quite interesting. Um, yes, and and I actually I'm realizing that Brandon is sitting there. Um, Brandon from Office, um, oh Office in Search of, um, was uh, our partner in it, and I absolutely need to mention that. So it wasn't five for six alone. Um, Brandon used to work with us and has started his own practice since then. Um, what was the inspiration? Well, inspiration I think came from the fact that uh, we as a design group were thinking about the fact that there were so many constraints on the site, you couldn't, you couldn't actually put anything in the ground, you couldn't attach anything in the columns, you couldn't um, um, put any sort of structural bearing on them, everything um, is sort of, they keep, um, they keep maintenance uh, schedules regularly and chip the concrete away and things like that. And so it had to be something that the structure was built in. And then I guess we thought as a group that there's got to be some humor in like, we don't have to take ourselves so seriously all the time. So that was the other part. Then we just thought it wouldn't be great if people have a smile on their face when, uh, when they encounter the project. So I think that was the combo. And then these genie lifts, um, sorry, this is the last part of it, is that these genie lifts, we realized, I, I can't remember who it was now, but we saw them on Google as we were driving through um, uh, the site that they're everywhere because they have this regular maintenance schedule for the gardener and um, to do their chip tests and so on. And so they were almost like occupying the site already. And now it was just a matter of dressing them up. And then it's um, Jeff and, and um, Brandon's partner, Jeff, um, and Brandon came up with this children's story to go with it where the, the bent buddies, what are their names, Brandon? Tinker, Trekker. Yeah. So they became these characters that, you know, would find a new life after they retired as, as, as working booms. They would still occasionally help out, but now they're more into fashion. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I was wondering, what it was like to start the company in Winnipeg. And I'm not sure if you came fresh out of school or it seemed like you worked somewhere before you are mentioning that. Uh, what was the architecture scene like in Winnipeg before you started? And where do you see like new firms in Canada going from now? Yeah, I have a lot to say about that, actually. Uh, when we started, it was pretty bleak. Um, I had been working for five years at the at the before mentioned um, practice. It was called Full My Architecture. A lot of to the to the principal, regardless of my criticism of the name, um, you know, learning things. And Sasha was working there. He got me the job. And so, again, getting your first job usually is about some sort of connection. Um, but also this guy was famous for taking in immigrants and... Um, allowing them to have kind of their first job. So that's how we both ended up there, really. And then we worked together for five years in this sort of design um, uh, collab collaboration that we carried on from school. And again, in school, like we did school um, student competitions together with, um, with Will and, um, and Sasha and myself. So that's, you know, goes back all to, to those days. But when we started then, um, it was it was pretty... Like there was not much going on architecturally. And I don't think there had been a new starter for a firm for about 10 years in Winnipeg at the time. Um, but, um, and we were lucky that our respective spouses at the time uh, had re decent jobs. Um, and we thought, okay, well, if we really fall on our faces, then we can always get another job. So let's try. We had two commissions at the time, both of them, you know, that gave us the courage to go on our own. 
but both of them ended within about a month. Um, but fortunately, by then we had gotten other jobs. Um, so it was, um, or died, you know, we didn't even complete them. They just went away. Um, and, but it didn't take a lot. Like we didn't take a business loan. We didn't do any of that stuff. We had a laptop and, and an SLR camera and, we took a retainer, which is really important business advice that I think is still in the Canadian handbook of practice. You should read that chop um, that take a retainer. And then I think it was $800 and we bought our printer with that. And so it was always kind of just getting the next check and then investing into something else. And we worked out of Sasha's living room for the first month and then out of mine for the next month. And then we rented a space that was 400 square feet or something uh, with an awful kind of metal halite parkade light that was beaming. And I don't know if you've ever seen Seinfeld, uh, the episode where this is for the old people here, um, but um, where Kramer is dealing with the chicken chef or whatever, like the red light, that was like our office. It was awful. Um, but, you know, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that don't don't have to be fancy off the, off the, you can be really kind of grinding it out in the beginning to make it work, right? You don't need a lot. You have your brain. That's what you're investing into. Um, I was wondering what it was like or what it's been like uh, kind of organizing, getting the ball rolling on these public events and discussions, things like Hill for 12 or 1200 and kind of what it's like to kind of get that started and also be following up on the discussions that happen at such sort of like meetings. Um, well, like the genesis of Table for 1200 was that pre de Rome uh, grant that we got. So we got to you know, we had a fund that we were able to use for those travels. So we were very lucky with that, obviously. And that was the impetus for that. But I think you don't always need the money. Like with, with Share Your Idea, we had no money. And it was premised on the idea that as long as we knew a couple of people on radio that we could talk to and get some publicity for it, then, um, you know, it was kind of crowdsourcing. Uh, and we recruited a bunch of students actually to uh, recruit their, you know, teams in high schools and different, different places. And Jeff's class, like, uh, again, Brandon's partners class, he was teaching, they all participated, things like that. And so it was more like, uh, trying to network and trying to figure out what a smart strategy is that doesn't need a lot of money. Um, and I think anybody here can do that. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to be rich and you don't have to be famous and you can, um, Hopefully, like you know, know a few people that know a few more people, and that's sort of the way that we've gone about it. And with table for twelve hundred two, that's the idea that we're not managing one hundred and fifty tables. Uh, there's a table captain that sort of sourced out and as a volunteer who organizes each of the tables, and they get to have their their dinner and 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 whatever. And then there's a competition that you have to decorate the table, and so that becomes the draw, um, and um, goes on from there. So strategy. Yeah. Matt, you all right. Yeah. Could you give an example when you weaponized the Metro format you had? Yes. Um well, uh, for sure, in the in the uh, well, you mean as a as a as a young. Well, at any time you you mentioned that. Yeah. Like... Yep. Yeah. Well, on a basic level, we do it every day. Like when we actually look at the the cost of something, like knowing intimately construction costs, being able to feed that in, and then seeing that the project is making a profit. Um, is what the developer and private development world, which is 80% of our work, that's what they're what they're looking for. And so then you know that you know there's a there's a little margin there that once those numbers are good, once we squeeze out an extra unit out of the equation, let's say that we figure out how to smartly plan it so that we can fit one more, uh, then that money that gets released at that point gets to be spent on architecture. The, the developer doesn't often care about the design enough to get involved in, in scrutinizing it if you deliver the numbers. And that's what I mean by weaponizing it. And so for us to, to know that and then know what, you know, cap rate they're shooting for or what sort of profit margin they're shooting for and uh, what the current going rates for, for everything are, or where to get something cheaper uh, and perhaps make it more customized yet um, is really the key to the equation.
you, everyone. That was a lot. I appreciate it. Great. So thank you very much. That was a really inspiring talk. Lots of great things to think about uh, in, in all of the, the years of students and, and professionals that we have here. So thank you very much. And I'll just uh, bring up our, our student representative here. He's going to uh, thank Johanna. So come on up, Jeanette. Um, so on behalf of the student body, faculty, and staff community here at the Department of Architectural Science, we'd like to thank you, Joanna, for sharing your work with us. Your, work, your words this evening have left us with a greater understanding of how architects can advocate for better architecture and how we can be driving forces for change in architecture and design. So thank you so much. Uh, th thank you, jo uh, Johanna. Uh, I, I forget how to say your name now. Um, yeah, that, that was absolutely amazing. Th thank you so much. Uh, before we go, uh, just, just a few final comments. Um, well, first of all, thank you to all, all the staff who helped us to do this and also the uh, students on the committee. Uh, a few I'd like to mention by name, uh, Bridget Dalima, Alan Sereno, and uh, sorry, I can't even read this because my eyes are going bad, uh, using she, uh, and the technicians, Ivan and Leo. Th thank you so much. I mean, it would be really hard uh, if you weren't here to make this happen. So thank you for that. Um, and one final note is this is our third and, and final lecture for the series this year, uh, but we're gonna have more next term. Uh, I hope you can all join. It'd be really nice if we could have even more people. Uh, it feels great that everybody's here again in person and we'd really like to build on it. So uh, I hope we get to see you uh, next term and thank you very much. <laughs>